Welcome back to Understanding Python. My name is Jake, and today we'll continue our mini-series on concurrency by introducing asynchronous programming. Async can be challenging to get into, but by the end of this video, you'll not only be able to use async, you'll also be able to mix in synchronous code as well. If you haven't watched my videos on threading and multiprocessing, I highly recommend you watch them first. If you have, then let's get started. We'll start today by modifying our intro script that we used for our threading video. In that script, we had two functions that printed names and ages of different people. In order to show the time between them, we had them sleep a random amount of time. There, we created the two threads for them. We started the threads, which they then executed in, and then waited for them to complete with join. But that's not going to work for async, because async works in a much different way than threading or multiprocessing. My analogy for threading and multiprocessing was thinking about them like a single lane road splitting into multiple lanes, allowing faster cars to move around slower cars. Well, the way I like to think about asynchronous programming is more like a fast food restaurant. Each customer waits in line for their turn to order. They place it, then step aside to wait for their order to be ready. While they wait, the cashier can help the next customer. The cashier doesn't need to wait for the first customer's order to be ready before taking the next order. Additionally, customers may not be served in the order that they arrived. If a customer's order takes a long time to prepare, then simpler orders may be ready first. So when you're thinking about how async execution works, it may be helpful to think back to a fast food restaurant. So with that in mind, what's it going to take to convert this script to used async? Well, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to create a loop. So we'll call loop is equal to async.io dot get event loop. And of course, at this point, we need to import async.io from the standard library. So we'll add that now. And at the end, we know we're going to want to close that loop. So this is effectively opening our restaurant. And this is closing our restaurant once all the customers have been served. And in between these statements is where we need to let our customers in take their order and serve them. So how are we going to do that? Well, we're not going to do it by creating threads, that's for sure. Instead, we're going to create a list of tasks. And those tasks are going to be print names and print age. But we can't just add any functions to this loop. We need to add things that are async compatible. In other words, we need cooperative customers, ones that are going to place their order and step aside. We can't do that with these functions. However, with some minor modifications, we can make these cooperative. In order to do this, we're going to introduce a couple new keywords we haven't seen in this series before, and that is async def. So this is defining an async function, print names. And there's one additional modification we're going to need here, because time.sleep isn't cooperative. Time.sleep is a greedy function, so it's not going to step aside. Instead, we're going to use asyncio.sleep. This is a special function in that when it sleeps, it steps aside. And the way that we're going to tell print names that asyncio.sleep is able to step aside is we use the new await keyword. So this reads await asyncio.sleep. At this point, when print names hits this line, it's going to trigger asyncio.sleep and it's going to step aside. We're going to do the same thing for print age. And because the name was bugging me in the last video, we're also going to make this plural. So finally, we have async def print ages. And we're going to do the same thing here. Instead of time.sleep, we're going to await async io.sleep. OK, now we have two async functions defined here. Now, what you'll notice about these async functions is that they have a mix of normal code as well as asynchronous code. What that means is that not everything in an async function has to be asynchronous. In fact, many things won't be. Really, only the things where you're waiting for some type of input or output, like you would with threading, should be awaited. That's the I and the O in async IO. Async, input, output. OK, we have our two functions here. How do we add them to the tasks? Well, we're going to do something a bit different. Instead of passing the functions themselves, we're actually going to call them here. 
At this point you may be thinking, if we're calling them here, wouldn't that just execute them like they would a normal function? But the answer to that is no. When you call an async function, you're actually getting something different back. So let's take a minute to pause. I'll comment these out. We'll save. I'll activate my virtual environment. And we'll load up this file in IPython to see exactly what's going on at this point. Okay, so we have print names. So far everything looks fine. It's a function. Same thing for print ages. Again, another function. But if we look in the tasks here, we see we have coroutine object print names and coroutine object print ages. That's because when you call these functions, it actually creates coroutines. And coroutines are what we're going to pass into the event loop. Those coroutines are the customers. Coroutines are a special construct in Python that allow for cooperative multitasking. They're the things that enable us to await different actions, yielding back execution to the primary loop. We're going to dig a lot more into coroutines into my next video, but I don't want us to get bogged down too much into coroutine specifics in this one, as we have a lot more to cover. So for now, we'll exit IPython, which it doesn't like because we created coroutines that were never awaited. Clear that out and give us our room back. Okay, at this point we have our tasks, which is a list of coroutines. But how do we execute them? Well, instead of starting and joining these coroutines separately, what we're gonna do instead is we're gonna call loop.run until complete. So this is what's going to take the orders and fulfill them until all customers have been served. But how do we get the customers into the line? We do that with a syncio.gather. What we're going to gather is an unpacked list of tasks or customers. So asyncio.gather is what gets everybody into the line. Run.complete is what actually takes the orders and fulfills them. So this is where the actual execution of print names and print ages happens. Okay, let's clean up our imports because we no longer need time or threading. Save it and give ourselves some room. Run it. And there we go. We see John, a bunch of ages go by, then finally Kate, Mike, Alex, and Anne. And since this is random, we should see a different order happen, this time with Kate appearing a little bit higher in the results. Okay, we just converted a threading script into an async IO script by creating our first async functions, which as we know, when we call them, create coroutines. Coroutines are what runs in our loop which we got earlier in the script. We got all of our customers together into the line and then ran them with run until complete. And then finally, we manually closed that loop. And while this script may have been helpful for introducing the basic concepts of async, I'm personally not a fan of tutorials that just leave it at sleep examples. So let's dig into something more real world. And we'll do that with our site status example. This is another scenario that's coming from the threading video. This time we're going to do it with async. One thing that we will need is a third party dependency called AIO HTTP or async IO HTTP, which is a great library for interacting with HTTP requests. In order to install that, we're going to use pip. So make sure that you're in your virtual environment and run pip install AIO HTTP. I'm going to spend a little time introducing what's happening in this get status function, but this is really only the surface of what you can do with AIO HTTP. But there's some important things to keep in mind because it also introduces a new statement for us. And that new statement is async with. This is an asynchronous context manager, and we're going to use two of them. The first one we're going to use for client session because this library manages sessions in a connection pool. So much like you could do with a thread pool or a process pool executor, this also has a pool of sessions that it can pass executions back and forth between. Next up, we're using async with for the response itself. You may have noticed that we're not explicitly doing any awaiting within the get status function. Well, the awaiting is actually happening here with this response. So it's going to await the response 
And another really nice thing is that after we exit the context manager, it's going to clean up that connection. Same thing with the session. When we exit the context manager, it's going to clean up the session. Okay, so the flow of this function is we're going to get our start time because we want to see how much time this is going to take. We're going to create our session. We're going to run our request and await the response coming back in. Then finally, we're going to get our stop time and calculate the total time it took. And print that out, then return the URL as well as the status. Okay, now execution for this is going to be a little bit different than what we did in our previous example. Instead of creating a loop, let's define a main function. First thing we're going to do in our main function is we're going to create the tasks that need to run. So we'll simply iterate for each URL in the URLs. Now, instead of just appending get status, passing in the URL, creating a coroutine, what we're instead going to do is we're going to create a task out of this. So we're going to wrap this coroutine in async.io.createTask. A task is effectively a wrapper object around coroutines to help async.io to manage the coroutine itself. A task job is to help monitor the execution of coroutines and allow async.io to get the status and cancel if need be. And it's this task that we're going to append to our task list. Okay, so at this point we have a list of tasks, but how are we going to run them? Well, the async.io comes with another nice feature, and we're going to use that now. So we're going to iterate for each task in completed, and we're going to pass in the list of tasks to that. So what asCompleted is going to do is it's going to put all those tasks on the loop and check on them. And as one completes, it's going to pop it off and give it to us here. And now that the task is saying that the coroutine it wraps is completed, we can pull the URL and the code from that coroutine by awaiting the task itself. Remember that for get status, we're returning both the URL and the response status. So that's what we're getting here. And then we can go ahead and print that out. Now as a good practice, because this can give us an error, we'll go ahead and wrap it in a try and accept. And we'll just print that the task and the error. Okay, now we have this async main function. But if we run the script right now, nothing's gonna happen. So how do we run this async function? Easily enough for functions like this, async.io comes with async.io.run. I'm gonna pass in a call to main. So remember, calling this main function creates the coroutine itself, and the coroutine is what's going to do the work. Okay. We have our main function defined, which creates all the tasks. The tasks are wrapping the coroutines, monitoring them and making it easier for async.io to manage them. We're then going to process all the tasks and pull out them as they complete. We get the results and print that out. Let's give ourselves some room and run this. Oh, looks like we have an issue. And looking up at my code, I see, oh, here it is. Instead of appending the single task, I appended all of the tasks, which doesn't really work. For those that have been screaming at the screen or already starting to type your comment, you can relax now. So we'll save and run it again. There we go, that looks much better. Okay, so we start the script. It says that it's getting the status of each of the sites. Google comes in first, then LinkedIn came in, even though it started last. Facebook is next, GitHub, and then Twitter came in last here. If we run it again, we may have a little bit different result. And here we go, this time the orders Google, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, and GitHub. But just like that, we were able to asynchronously get the status of all five sites with the help of AIO HTTP. Now this environment works really well when everything is async compatible. But what happens if you have code that can't be converted to async? meaning you want to mix synchronous code in with asynchronous code. Well, in our last example, we're going to take this script, which uses subprocess to run a series of commands. Subprocess.run is a blocking command, so it isn't async compatible in its current form, meaning that each of these commands that we're going to run has to wait for the previous to complete. If we were to do that now, we would see that who am I runs really fast 
pinging Google five times took a relatively larger amount of time, and then the following commands were much faster, running LSB release as well as the Python version. So how do we make this async friendly? Well, our main target here is going to be that subprocess.run command. So let's start the conversion. First, we'll import async IO. Next, we'll convert run command into an async function, allowing it to be executed as a coroutine. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to use a really nice helper function that async.io comes with on subprocess.run. And that is async.io.toThread, which is awaitable. So async.io.toThread is going to spin up a new thread to run this subprocess in. Now the arguments for this isn't the execution of subprocess.run. Instead, like we did with threading, we're going to pass in the target function and then its arguments. So the arguments for that being the command itself, our pipe for standard in, and our pipe for standard out. And just like that, we made run command async friendly. And now that it's async friendly, we can't run it like we normally would, because remember, calling run command here would just create a series of coroutines. It wouldn't actually execute anything. So let's extend our conversion here as well. We'll create another main function. We'll pull commands under that, and we'll also keep track of a list of tasks. We'll move our for loop over as well, and take the coroutine that's created here and wrap it in a task. Then we'll append, this time our singular task, to the tasks list. Now, unlike our site status example, we're not actually returning anything from run command. So we can do execution a bit more simply with that. So instead of using as completed, we'll just await asyncio dot gather, unpacking our list of tasks into it. So this will add it all to the loop and we'll await the execution of all of those. Finally, We'll call asyncio.run and then call main and pass it into run. All right, so at this point, our conversion should be complete. So let's give it a go. Oh, and there we go. We have who am I running first? It tells us that it's kicking off all the commands one after the other. Who am I? Ping, LSB release, and Python version. The first to complete, unsurprisingly, is who am I telling us that the output is Jake. Python version completed next, telling us that we are on Python 3.11.4. Next up was LSB release, telling us that we are on Fedora 38. And then finally, pinging Google five times came in last because it's the only one that actually reached out to the network. And just like that, we converted a synchronous script into an asynchronous script. If you had more things to do in here, say combine it with site status, you could absolutely do that as well. Now that run command is async friendly, thanks to asyncio.toThread, it can be incorporated into other asynchronous code. Now there's a number of different ways we could have done this. And there's a lot more to asyncio, but this is a great place to get started. And that wraps up this video. Now that you have an understanding of how to do asynchronous programming, give it a try in a project of your own and let me know how it goes. If you have any further questions or recommendations for others, leave a comment down below. As always, today's code will be added to the understanding GitHub repo, so check the description for a link. And of course, if you have any questions or suggestions for topics you'd like me to cover, let me know in the comments section. To keep up with the series, please consider subscribing. Thanks for watching.